Right, so uh, here we are, the third and final installment of this year's Seahawka Lectures, and very pleased that we have Chris McDowell with us. And uh, before I introduce uh, his talk, uh, let me just uh, take you back a little bit. When I first finished my master's, well, I only finished my master once, anyhow, uh, I joined corporate. And my first job was working with market research and uh, credit risk modeling. So I learned very quickly that it's one thing to know your methods and assumptions, and quite another to actually be able to communicate what it actually means for business, right? Uh, and one of the main ways to do that effectively is, uh, of course, plots and pictures, right? And I keep saying to my students, hey, listen, what do you do when you get data? Plot it, right? Bar chart, pie chart, whatever. Uh, because a picture speaks a thousand words, right? What I don't say to them, and I, maybe I should, is that a picture can also misspeak a thousand words. Right, so um, a lot of thought needs to go behind how do you want to communicate, like how to communicate correctly. And that's exactly what Chris works on. And I'm so very thrilled uh, that we have him speak today because I'm actually myself curious and I'm looking forward to learning a few things here. Um, so just a quick note on Chris. Um, Chris is basically a geographer who did his PhD and postdoc here at University of Auckland. Uh, and unlike me, who w went to corporate and came back to academia, uh, he stayed in academia and then went back, went out, right? So anyhow, uh, he really enjoys being a practitioner, so he he's worked as a geographer, uh, and he's also worked as an analyst and data uh, journalist uh, at various places, including Lanka Research and, of course, journalism with Herald. Uh, and these days, uh, he works uh, for the Health New Zealand, and I think he works as, actually, let me read this correctly, because I couldn't believe it the first time I saw it. Uh, he uh, works as a surveillance and intelligence specialist. Very interesting. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So, without further ado, let's give Chris a warm welcome. And I'll let Chris explain uh, himself what he actually does. Oh, would you be able to turn the... Yes, yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, kia ora koutou. Thank you. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, I've had, yeah I, maybe I will talk about that a tiny bit. Oh, and I'll stand here. Um, yeah, so I've had quite a strange career. Um, I started actually here at the University of Auckland, worked, um, did a, did a uh, PhD on representing um, vaguely defined geographic objects um, through which change over time. Um, and it was, um, it was, I think it seemed a bit of a confusing thing to a lot of people in my life, but it actually led to a, um, a job at Manaki Whenua um, at Lanka Research, working as a, with the soil science people there and also the vegetation teams and cultural heritage teams. So anywhere where there were things that were changing over time and no one could quite agree where they began and ended in, in time and space. Um, and then I've gone on to uh, work as... Um, at the National Library of New Zealand on the Digital New Zealand um, project there as the technical lead. Um, worked as a freelancer for a long time. Worked in the New Zealand Herald and at the spin-off um, in media during COVID. And then have moved um, in the last 18 months to public health and working at Te Whatuora, especially with um, commun uh, communicable disease. And I guess the common thread throughout all of that has been trying to communicate data to people and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, so the, the, the talk is ostensibly about what's behind the map, the process of um, data visualization. But I, I guess I wanted to start by just sort of thinking about why I even bother with data visualization at all. Like, I think that it's useful to know why you're doing a thing before you actually start to do that. And the thing which I always come back to, and it's a, it's a very common example um, within this sphere, um, does anyone know who Francis um, Anscombe is? Could I just get a show of hands? Okay, great, excellent. Um, so in the 1970s, um, there was a, a quite famous paper published by Anscombe, um, which detailed Anscombe's quartet. So Anscombe's quartet was a series, um, it was actually four different series of numbers, um, which um, when you look at them, 
uh, can be you know, quite difficult to, to, to pass just on first glance. So you've got this um, series one, series two, series three, series four, and each of them there's an X and a Y value. And when you um, start looking at these in a statistical framing, e each of those four data sets have the same number of elements, the mean is the same of the X, the mean is the same as the Y, the sample variance is the, is the same or very similar, and they've got the same linear regression that you can fit through them. Um, and so with all the precision that statistics can lend, the, these main kind of ways of, uh, the main forms of descriptive statistics, you come up with the same result. But when you plot them on a graph, these four different series, you get a really, really different picture. Um, the first series, it sort of um, kind of follows a, a kind of a classic linear trend where they're bouncing along a trend line. Um, in the second one, at top right, you've got something which looks like a curve where it's kind of coming up to a peak and then trailing off. And in the bottom two, it looks like you've got a pair of outliers. You've got something which is kind of heading up really steadily, and then one thing that's wildly different from the rest, and the other where everything's the same except on the x-axis, except for one which is hugely different on the y. And so um, Robert Cassara, um, I think, has, has probably uh, has my favorite um, uh, it, it, the Anscombe's Cortez has been sort of studied many times and used as a, as a demonstrative example many times. But Cassara, he describes it as saying that while visualization may not be as precise as statistics, it provides a unique view onto data that can make it much easier to discover interesting structures than numerical methods. And that's what I always come back to um, in terms of why bother to do data visualization. Because even though we can lend these different statistical methods to understanding a set of numbers, when you start to turn them into a, a graphical um, rendering, there's all of these things that come out that, that not only for yourself you can see, but you can communicate them with people who might not be so well versed in, in mathematics or statistics or various forms of kind of um, numerical modeling. And it just really kind of opens it up and, and democratizes these things, albeit perhaps in a more fuzzy way. Um, and just as, as a side note, this is something I saw recently in Scientific American. Um, it's actually Anscombe's Quartet, but with these kind of innovative renderings, including a, a dinosaur, where all of these things fit the Anscombe's Quartet's uh, set of descriptive statistics, and yet they're, 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 they're really different. Um, this, though, is perhaps the, the most, um, I guess this is like the biggest kind of personal breakthrough for me and, and which changed the way that I think about data visualization. And that's the idea that we often talk about maps and, and data visualization as though in terms of outputs. Um, and I don't know that that's a, a particularly helpful way to think and talk about it often. And instead, I, I would encourage you maybe to think about it as a process, particularly if you're someone who's either a practitioner in data visualization or wanting to get into it or com collaborating with people on it or commissioning it, is to think of it as something that unfolds over time. And um, specifically, I would draw a, um, um, a distinction between visual thinking on the one hand and visual communication on the other. So visual thinking is something that um, tends to happen in, in private and it's something that is um, often you're in a more exploratory mode, whereas visual communication is, is something that, which comes generally much later in a process, and it's where you're presenting to a, an audience who may or may not have much knowledge about this thing, and it's something that happens in the public realm. So I'm going to kind of step through a couple of examples of each one of these things. So in terms of, when we're working in terms of, um, in the frame of visual thinking, the, the data that we're working with is often mysterious. Um, it's, we might be working with stuff that we, we just don't know what really is in there, and it will land on our desks, or we'll um, encounter it in a report, or download it from um, a website, or a, or a government service. And it will just be this big kind of like, uh, trail of numbers and, and text and, um, and um, uh, table upon table. 
so this is like an example, um, literally of an example that I had to work with um, a f uh, quite a few years ago, and it's um, injury data. It was about all that I knew about it. And the very first thing that I did was to create a visualization that was not a visualization that I was ever actually going to use in order to communicate with others. It was only for myself. Um, and so I threw it into a thing called CSV fingerprint and just got the kind of general sense of how the data was structured. And so this here is, is an output of, of the CSV fingerprint tool where we take these different columns that we were looking at before, um, the one, two, three, four, five, six columns, and it tells us that the left two columns are both character strings. They're all kind of text in yellow there. The next column is all integers. It's just a whole lot of whole numbers. And then we've got a column which has just got some sort of like text strings, but then a whole lot of missing data and empty data. Then we've got more text, and then we've got a, a mix of integers and decimals. And that's not really useful to anyone apart from me, but it's really useful to me <laughs> to just like, and like literally this is sort of like a five to 10 minute thing. This, this visualization has a very short lifespan, but it's part of the process of exploration and doing that visual thinking. The, the next thing that I, I guess I think about <laughs> constantly, and it's kind of 80, 90% of my my job often, is that the data will, will probably need some cleaning. Um, and, and so I remember sitting here and, and seeing um, oh, several people, seeing, seeing Hakenwell wherever Hakenwell is, and, and Hadley um, talking about this in terms of, in, in very specifically in an R sense. And for me, I'm often, especially these days, using R to do this. Um, but the idea that the data is often um, poorly formed um, or poorly formed in terms of um, using uh, computers and statistical methods to work with it. So this is an example, I think it's from the Household Economics Survey, um, of, a, um, of a data set that is available on a government website that is supposed to be kind of, you know, <laughs> ready to go, um, but there are just so many things that are, that are problematic in terms of trying to do any kind of um, analysis with a... Um, a um, statistical programming language or a visualization package or, or whatever. Um, you've got three different levels of headings, you've got merged cells, you've got um, uh, text as data, you've got formatting as data, you've got kind of miss you've got columns that spread multiple times over um, where one where two columns occupy one column's worth of data. And this is and then various kind of nestings on that left hand side which kind of conflate um, uh, um, part whole relationships using only um, uh, the, the, the bolding and the formatting in order to sort of designate which is which. And it's just kind of a mess. And so much of getting good at data visualization is actually just getting sort of halfway decent at working with this kind of blur. Um, it's <laughs> and it's something which though happens in private. And it's all part of the, of the visualization process. So you're working in private and you're making these things that are only, you're probably gonna be the only audience for it. Or it might be that it's you and your colleague or the person that you're communicating with like on a semi-regular basis on the other side of the world. Th this is another visualization that no one apart from people who occasionally go to a talk like this ever see. Um, and it's just, the contents of a drive that I was trying to clean up one day because I had just too much stuff on it. Um, and so it's a, it's a tree map, a, a nested hierarchical tree map, um, but it's not something that I would ever communicate with another person about, except just to kind of like say, oh, these files are really big, we should probably delete those. Um, and I guess the other thing is that it's something that explores many dimensions. Um, so, when you're doing this kind of visual thinking, the more techniques that you can use where you can quickly kind of like iterate through different views of the data, um, this, is really, this is really valuable, it's really good stuff. And I'm gonna show you an example worked through. Um, so exploring by direct manipulation um, and saying, what if we look at it like this? What if we look at it like this? So anything where you can, um, the process is iterative and it's also tentative, but if you can quickly flip around and view the data in a new way, in a new form, that's incredibly valuable. So this is an example, um, myself and my friend um, Tim Denis back in 2019, um, we, we made an atlas um, 
called We Are Here, an Atlas of Aotearoa. And this is, I'm going to show you, I think, yeah, two different examples over the course of this talk, which it just kind of worked through of the, of the process where we moved from kind of, um, or it's actually my part of it mostly, and then at the very end handing over to Tim for the layout and colouring. Um, but working through an example. So this is an example that ended up in the book. Um, the one that this is in the book is actually the budget, um, the, uh, the New Zealand budget of appropriations. So this is sort of how it started out. Well, this is how it started out. There was actually a few steps before that, but I don't unfortunately have screenshots of it. Um, what I was trying to do was to take all of the major areas, the, the, uh, what, what are in parliamentary terms called the votes, that the government allocates money to. So um, everything from sort of the huge um, uh, departments and ministries like um, uh, social welfare um, and um, education and health and, and justice. Um, um, but also looking at things which get a lot less funding, such as the Ministry for the Environment, um, uh, uh, the Office of um, uh, the um, Ministry of uh, Pacific Peoples, and try and kind of give them the, all the same space on the page, um, but also convey the relative difference between the, the amount of money that was allocated to them. And so this is where I started. Like, this is not obviously ready for anyone to look at. All that it is is it's just the dollar values assigned and in, put into a square. Um, and then kind of having seen that, and this is all actually working, the initial data preparation happened in R, but by this stage it was in D3.js, which is a JavaScript framework for doing data visualization. And what I started doing was like just <coughs> putting a random dot, each dot representing $1 million, into, the, into each of the boxes. Um, so you can see some, um, even without the names, you can kind of get the vibe of what these different, some of these different things might be. Um, so everything from $24.1 billion down the bottom there, up to a few that are, that are very, very small. And in fact, I think that even on this one, I'm not actually showing all of the votes that were allocated. Um, and then started um, going, okay, well, what if we just color things a little bit? What if we um, put some names on there? And, and the, the, these screenshots are all probably taken about 20 or 30 minutes apart as I'm kind of like got a coding terminal in one window and, um, and a visualization in, in another screen. And I'm just kind of like coding away, hitting save, seeing what happens. Um, and so you're starting to see things like um, social development, um, uh, what have we got? Health over there, finance, all of these deep blue ones, and then smaller ones like serious fraud, office of the clerk, and the ombudsman, Pacific peoples. Um, and then starting to kind of go, okay, well, I'm gonna, there's going to be an audience for this. This isn't really looking great at the moment, but it's still, how do I communicate it in a way that, that it can be understood? And so starting to not just put the dots, because the dots kind of give an initial view on it and a kind of, they're almost tonal um, or um, a kind of like, if you think of like a, um, a hierarchy of, of, of comprehension, they, they're the first thing that you see, but then you can drill down on specific numbers for, for, more, um, uh, for more detail. And then at about that point, that was, that's where I would think that it kind of tips over from that kind of visual thinking into the kind of the realm of um, the public and thinking about the actual visual communication and the presentation of these ideas to an audience. So at this stage for myself, the data wasn't well understood until I really got to that point. And after kind of an hour, two, three hours of working with it, I finally felt like I understood the data enough to communicate to another person. And that's when I started to go, okay, well this, okay, if I've got someone coming in to read this cold, is this gonna work? And it was working in a sense, but it's still, I think by trying to constrain all of the dots into a small space, um, it, it didn't really convey the magnitudes of difference between them, just how huge the spend on health and social development is compared to something like um, Pacific Peoples or the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment. So at that stage, we started, um, or I started to lay things out on the page. I think this was before Tim got involved, and then the final thing you'll see is when, after Tim and I have worked in dialogue together. And so what I ended up opting to do was to lay these out from smallest to largest and to devote the same amount of space to the title 
And so to make sure that everything in terms of the title and the words would have the same um, real estate, but then take the dots and lay those out in such a way that you could really look all the way across to social development on the right and see just, just how large it was. Um, this was still not quite right. What we try to do, you'll see that there are these darker green sections where we pull them away, um, but it kind of resulted in a confusion when we showed people it as to what the relationship was between the part and the whole, and they thought they were sort of different ministries and departments. So where, that was where Tim got involved, and where we ended up in the final version was to kind of just pack them together, but um, have some explanatory text. I think actually this isn't quite the final version, because we have some how to reads on the left-hand side and a bit more text. Um, but to, to, to unify them, um, and to, 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 but to still be able to say, okay, well, um, uh, superannuation is this massive green chunk here, which <laughs> when we show it to people, people, mean, some people at least often think it's the doll, um, but no, it's, it's super. The doll is actually quite a small, it's just a few of the dots up there. Um, uh, and I think we ended up in quite a good place with this. It, yeah, there's one more iteration beyond it, which um, I regret I haven't actually put in. But this is the point at which, like, that, those are sort of the, the, the steps that uh, progressed through, at least for me, in terms of going from something where I don't really know what I'm dealing with to something which is ready to show to another person. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time just using, showing you a series of, of techniques, kind of small and large, which I think are quite useful and, and often neglected in doing that. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, but before I do that, um, one of the things was just the idea to reduce the... Um, to complex data just down to, to a few dimensions. So, so this is something that I saw in the Washington Post earlier this year, um, and I thought it was a really interesting piece of work. Um, what it was, was it was looking at um, what in the United States seemed to be ostensibly a, um, a hiring gap between um, uh, Democratic-leaning states and, um, and Republican states. Um, and so this is the, what the first sort of chart where they're just sort of showing um, seasonally adjusted, there's kind of like, um, uh, and that, that big spike of course is, is COVID, um, is, is the difference between um, the um, Trump voters and the Biden voters. But what I really liked about it was instead of kind of having a, a quite a complex interactive visualization, they kind of broke down its various components into a, into a series of, um, of different charts. And um, the, the upshot of it was really that kind of it was looking at um, this, this quote at the top, that the red sto states weren't necessarily creating the jobs faster. Um, they were hiring more often because folks were bouncing around. So the, it was m m much more, when you look at, break it down in terms of the number of hires and the number of people quitting, in both cases, you've got the red states um, at a higher rate. And so what's actually been represented is churn there. And this idea that you can take something that's, that seems like um, this quite complicated thing and just break it down into its little little individual parts and tell the story through that. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a fancy interactive. It can be just some, a, a series of quite interesting, um, sorry, quite just sort of informative little charts. So the idea that it's not just that there's a hiring gap, it's actually that there's both hirings and firings and quittings. Quittings? Um, but this is what I really wanted to talk about. Um, I totally forgot that that bit was in there. Um, it's just this idea of using labels and captions. And I think it's something that's increasingly become neglected over the last 10 years. And I don't know, I'm looking at Hakawal. Hakawal, you've heard me say this probably for 10 years. <laughs> I always get up and talk about labels and captions. But I think that they can be the, one of the most important parts of a data visualization and a graphic. And they're so, they're the thing that can be really simple to do and can really elevate a thing, and they're, they're often just not there. Um, and what I'll often come back to is, is things like the map of, um, that comes in the, in the um, front piece of Wind in the Willows, which is like quite a, um, a like it's this lovely watercolor map, and it's quite a, a evocative of place, but what it really, to my eyes at least, elevates it are the labels. And that's, um, so showing Otter's house and Rat's house and where the weasels and stoats are and Toad Hall, it's the, 
the um, the the naming of places and um, the um, putting these things like w words that you can use to talk about the map and navigate the map that really elevate it. In a, in a data visualization though, or cartography sense, and so this is where I've come from, um, similarly things like Tolkien's The Hobbit and the use of labels in those. Um, but here, for example, these are, I'm sorry, they're a little washed out. These New York Times uh, maps um, from the 2014 election, these really highly detailed um, uh, choropleth maps of the results of that first, um, um, uh, sorry, I think these might actually be midterm. Yeah, so the midterms. Um, but what I think is really interesting is the use of captions that are explaining anomalies in the or or um, either anomalies or uh, representative trends within the within the map. So in the bottom left there, that uh, uh, Mr. Warner lost the southwest, which he won by large margins in 2008 or Loudoun County, which voted for President Obama both times turned red. And so drawing the reader's eye, and this is in editorial maps I'm talking, much more than kind of like scientific communications, um, uh, but to be able to kind of contextualize what's going on and both help a reader understand explicitly that thing, but also give them confidence to read the rest of the map. Um, similarly, this one here in Minnesota, um, Mr. Franken won Hennepin um, and Ramsey counties by margins similar to President Obama's. Like, it, it's quite a small thing, but it just helps bring the person into the map, I think, and then from watching readers engage with stuff like this, working, working through the rest of it. Um, this is one from um, uh, that Tim and I also did. It actually appeared originally on the spin-off, and that's that this rendering that, that I'm showing you here. It was um, horizontal over over two spreads in the atlas. Um, but this is really like an area graph stretched out over time. But what it's showing is the um, a kind of we called it a visual history of New Zealand parliaments, and it's showing every parliament going back to um, the, uh, the the formation of parliament in um, the 19th century, and the kind of different ages of of the parliament, and. We could have done this with a, just a, showing the graph and a legend, but by directly labeling it, I think it does a few things. Like, it makes it, makes it a bit easier for the, for the reader to interpret what's going on. Um, there isn't a need to kind of constantly be looking backwards and forwards between a legend um, and, and a necessity to decode the graphic. Instead, it's, I, I like hope it's a little bit more generous um, and that it's um, directly labeling things. And whenever you're looking at a block of color, your eye never needs to move too far in order to see what that color represents. Um, it also gives us the um, ability to tell little, little micro stories within it, um, such as either the women, uh, women gaining the right to vote um, in the late 19th century, <laughs> Um, or the moment where Parliament fixes its, its seats to, um, to 80 and then it becomes like very static for a long time, um, or the introduction of MMP. I, and I think that um, also when you're engaging in visual communication, it's really important just to have something to say. Um, and this is particularly um, important, I think, for any kind of editorial visualization or visualization that involves um, an audience who might be a more general audience. Not so much perhaps for scientific visualization, um, although, <laughs> although I still think that um, there I think your, your visualizations should have something to say. It's just that it might be that you are um, uh, trying less to persuade and more to present um, uh, something to show to something to an audience. So this, for example, I, I think this is a really um, a really strong visual. It's, it's a really strong visualization in terms of its um, uh, what it's what it's trying to say. I think there are things that could be improved upon in terms of its um, visual presentation. But I, I mean, it's a, it's really great. Um, so every row here represents a um, an America a state in the um, in the United States of America. Every column represents a year going back to the late 1920s, and it's just showing the moment where um, the vac where the measles MMR vaccines were introduced, um, and uh, oh, I assume it's MMR. 
No, it wouldn't be, would it? Sorry, I'm looking at the public health people. Um, it, when the first vaccine was introduced for measles, um, and so the brighter the colour, the, the more um, uh, people were um, uh, negatively affected by the disease, I think it might actually be deaths, and then you can see this moment where it just trickles off into um, a, a low background noise. Um, it's, it's a really strong piece of um, uh, visual communication. I think you should always consider the reader, and we're going to go just into a little deep dive of pretty much my favorite. Um, for me, the, the person who's in recent years has probably influenced me the most in terms of data visualization, um, uh, Lisa Charlotte Muth, um, who works these days, I think, at Data Rapper still. Um, and this is really one of her examples that she uses in, in workshops, but I just think it's incredible. Um, it actually comes from the, from the New York Times, and it's a, um, a graph series of um, several different years of um, the level of, um, of Arctic ice as it um, changes um, year on year on year. And what's so good about this are all of these little details. So one of the things about it, so remembering that this is in a, in a newspaper for a general audience, is just the repetition of the subject of the, of the graph. So over and over again, Arctic ice cover, ice extent, ice extent, sea ice, ice cover, area of Arctic covered by ice, Arctic ice extent. There, there's sometimes a tendency for, which I see within people creating data visualizations is, well, I said it here, it's in the title or it's in this caption or, or whatever, and the assumption that because they've put it in that the reader will necessarily have, have caught it. Um, you can go overkill on this, but I think that it's really um, beneficial to repeat in slightly different ways the subject of the graphic, particularly if it's a complex graphic, particularly if it's for a general audience. Um, the other things that, that are done are just these little explanations that are through there. So Arctic ice cover usually reaches an annual maximum around March. Each line represents one yearly cycle of sea ice fluctuations. Ice cover usually shrinks to its minimum in September. Winter, summer, just the highlighting of these things, um, I've, I've tried to show here, are, are ways to like, each one of them is a tiny little instruction that adds to the person's knowledge and comprehension of, of the graph, um, which is a complex graph. The, the, another thing that is done in this graph that I think is really great is, um, uh, is that there's a unification through color between explanation and the thing which is being talked about. So for the general notes that are being made, they're, they're in black. But these particular things in the teal kind of icy blue are about these teal icy blue lines. And so by kind of by coloring them the same, it, it, it doesn't need to be ex, um, uh, explicitly drawn out in a, in a legend or in a, um, some sort of coda. Instead, um, uh, it can, um, it's, it's uh, just through the, uh, through the close proximity and the sharing of color, it emphasizes um, that they are the same thing. Another thing that is done is this mixing of uh, qualitative description with quantitative description on the y-axis. Um, so we've got the, um, the extent of Arctic ice described there on the y-axis in terms of the millions of square kilometers, but uh, it shows this, all of a sudden the scale is broken and it's the size of Canada, the size of Alaska, the size of California, which grounds it those themselves are quite difficult things to, to conceptualize, but they're um, more um, uh, tangible than, than just um, a pure kind of like big number, small, uh, smaller number, but also a very big number. Um, it's a really skillful piece of work. Labels, more labels. I love labels so much. They're just the best. Um, these were, um, sometimes, um, these were, um, images that I'm going to show from the James, uh, the first round of James Webb um, uh, telescope images that came back um, last year. What is time? I can't even really remember anymore with COVID, but last year. Um, so these incredible images came back, and this is the way to. Oh, 20 minutes, great. I thought it was two. That's good. Um, uh, <laughs> 
these are images as they appeared on the NASA website. And these are fine, these are great. Like, it's amazing that NASA made these images of, of, available. Um, and they're big and beautiful, and you can blow them up, and they're like super high resolution, and they're just incredible. Um, but then this is the way that the Washington Post presented them, which was just to add a few labels. Um, and so there's this note at the top. It would, it would take um, about 12 years traveling at the speed of light to cross this area. Um, there's a label, the Carina Nebula, and then there's just this like really simple note, these are stars, um, which is quite a welcoming thing to put into um, a visualization like this or a uh, kind of borderline visualization. Then the, the labeling of the nebula, and then this little note about how astro astronomers don't know the full story of how these features formed. Um, and these are stars that have formed in our galaxy um, from the dust in the nebula. Um, so that these are, these are um, um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's um, again, like I, I guess I'm, I keep falling back to the, to the um, word sort of generous. And it is sort of generous, um, but it's also, um, it's also just giving a, a people a way into this quite opaque, beautiful and majestic image, but it's just something to hold on to, um, that as you read through the rest of the article, you've got a little bit more grounding. Um, similarly, uh, this is as, the, as it appeared on the NASA website. Again, amazing, incredible. Um, but this was the way that the Washington Post labeled it. Um, as, as, um, so they took uh, the name that NASA had assigned it, um, Stefan's Quartet, Quintet. And these, these explanations come from within the notes on NASA, but all that's happened here is they're directly on, on the graphic. Um, so these five galaxies labelled um, from the first group of ga galaxies ever discovered in 1877. Scientists believe that these clouds are the, a sign of black hole in the middle of the galaxy. Um, I won't read through all of these, but just to, to highlight where the ga galaxies are clashing together and that um, this particular star on the top, this is one from our own Milky Way. It's not actually part of this, constel um, of this um, uh, collection of nebula. It's, it's a really neat piece of work. Similarly, from, from the New York Times, um, this came from earlier this year, and it's, again, it's really subtle um, as, a, as a way of... Um, visualizing something and it's not even it's not really data although it is about location and position um, what they've done is it was about um, uh, a piece around um, illegal airstrips um, but just the outlining of the airstrip and drawing the eye in but just little techniques that have been used like the way that the lines are dotted as they pass behind the trees and the way that they just subtly go around the people, around the backs of the people, in order to create the kind of the the the, um, the sense that this is a thing that is both um, uh, kind of part of the world and yet not part of of the world as it as it would be seen if you actually were to see this. It's um, yeah, it, it's a nice little technique. Th this is one of my favourite maps. I just really love it. Um, <laughs> Again, it's from um, <laughs> it's from an early 20th century, um, I think a pre-World War II Atlas of Australia, um, a wall map series of atlases designed for classrooms. Um, I found it in the National Library of Australia one day on, in their online collections. Um, and I think it's really, it's really great. Like, it's really effective. It's a map of sheep and wheat. Um, the wheat is all in terms of the, um, is, is shown mostly in terms of the, the cross hatching, whereas the sheep is shown in terms of the, um, the, 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 the level of whites and greens, the hue of the map. Um, but there's also this la these labels, which are just like some sheep, no sheep, um, <laughs> and immediately um, you kind of get the general pattern of, of, um, of uh, sheep agriculture in, in Australia, but, but the, the legend is available to dig in more deeply. And it is a more complex map than it might initially seem because you've got these, um, you're actually seeing two different um, uh, um, thematic layers being compared together when you start to kind of like drill into it. But there's just something about just the no sheep, some sheep, that I think makes it really, really powerful as a, as a thing. And I imagine it being on a, on a wall in a classroom or something. Um, Similarly, this is a, um, 
a map um, which I screenshotted from The Guardian I, on my phone in the very early stages of COVID. Um, so it was at a time, uh, um, it's from 3rd of March 2020, and there are 51 confirmed cases of the coronavirus in the UK at this time. Um, but the reason I'm showing you, um, I, there is some sort of novelty to that, um, and it might look quaint um, now, um, or yeah, hopefully not bring back too bad of memories, but the, um, the use of the numbers and the labels and calling out the very specific places where they were. So th Bradford, Dundee, Merton, um, Reading, Devon, and just this kind of sense that this thing was kind of all over the country, but just in these very, very small levels, and the use of the, the actual counts on there in addition to the proportional symbols. Um, I suspect that um, there are definitely like versions of this map which are just the proportional symbols, or there are versions of this map where they're just the choropleth, where it's just kind of what, what sometimes people might call a heat map, um, where it's just these coloured polygons. But I would suggest that it's, there's something about being able to show, the, where possible, the explicit labels alongside with the data value, and then a graphical um, uh, depiction of that value as well. The tying of those things together allows you to make sort of little sentences in your head about the data. Um, and that's what I'm showing you over and over again with these labels, is there's, there's something about being able to put text on a map in partnership with a visual graphical rendering of the data that allows a person to kind of make statements about it, either for themselves or for other people or for an audience. Um, be that audience, colleagues, or, or, or whatever, or friends. Um, this is a map that comes from um, uh, expository methods in the humanities um, by uh, Marc Monnier, um, which is, uh, for my money, one of the best cartography books ever, ever written in the, in the late 90s. It's an incredible book. Um, it's the same map four times, but each time just with totally different labels. Um, and it's all just about a place and about navigation between a place. But each of the, the different ways that, they, that um, Mon Monnier used captioning and labels on this map throws completely different emphasis. So um, in that top one, it's kind of emphasizing um, the kind of like distinction between the, the use of like different modes of transport, um, bicycle versus rowing versus car. Um, map B, top right, is about um, kind of like, um, it actually has the little distances on the, on, the, um, on the road segment, so you can sort of see how many kilometers they are. Um, and but um, just sort of mentioning the bridge and the swamp as these geographic features. Map C, bottom left, is actually sort of cautioning about um, what might happen on a marine um, use, where it's like overland routes to avoid tidal bores and treacherous shoals. Um, and then the final one is, um, uh, it's kind of like, in some ways it's quite low information, but then it's got just sort of an overall summary of each of the route in the bottom. Um, but it actually has these place names of Yucky Marsh and Tarts Mountain. Um, and each one of them, just through the use of labels and, and captions, kind of like puts a totally different slant on the same map. And so labels are kind of like, they're not just about kind of like this thing at the end where you put the reference stuff in. They, they can actually just transform um, the way that a, that, a, that a map will be interpreted. Um, this is another amazing New York Times example, and I'm sorry that these are going to be so blurry. I can't find a better um, example of these Jonathan Curran maps. Well, this is not by Curran, the next one is. But what, what he did was he took these maps of US drought as put out um, uh, by the, by the um, government meteorological um, agency, and, and kind of redid them. So this one here, he's saying there's a lot of lines here. There's a bunch of logos. The lines are really heavy and dark. Um, I might be interested in the drought data, but it feels just like layer after layer has been stacked upon it. Um, and so this is how he transformed it. Instead of just pulling stuff away, and I want to be clear, this is actually 
um, as someone who often has to make automated maps as part of my, my day job, this is like a totally fine map if it's the same audience who are, are reading it and they become accustomed to the interpretation of these things. It's more important that you just get this thing out quickly than it is that you spend all of this time finessing it. Um, but if you're going for a wider audience, um, for whatever reason, what, what um, Koro, Koro does here is he just starts pulling stuff away um, and then starts labeling the states themselves just so a person can find themselves on the map um, and reworking the legend so that it doesn't have the little codes on it. Instead, it's just exceptional, extreme, severe, moderate, abnormally dry. The sort of language that you might use in order to, um, um, to describe a... Um, um, a drought to somebody, um, which are, it's very close to the language which is used in the original, um, but just a little tighter. Because um, every time you put like another visual element on a, on a map or visualization, you're kind of asking your audience to make a decision as to what they should look at. Um, and that can, it sounds strange, but it can become quite burdensome. Um, and so when I compare these two, I think that that left map is absolutely great for circulating within a government department, particularly if, if the audience is used to looking at similar maps like that day on day. But for a, a more general audience, to remove some of the, um, uh, of the reference materials that kind of uh, may burden and tie down the map, um, uh, it, 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 for me it just really lifts it. And I'm just going to figure out, like, sort of finish up with a couple of case studies. Cool. Um, both of these are case studies um, from stuff that I've that I, I, I've either done myself or, did, in this case, did with Tim. Um, so this was um, a f ah a person who, who worked on this is also in the room. Um, um, this is a musical timeline. Um, and this is one of the things that I'm most happy with in in the We Are Here book. So it's actually over two spreads. So it starts in um, the mid-1920s, uh, and every little line is a different musical artist, um, either an individual performer or a group. And th the, uh, the span, as best we could tell, is, um, is denoted by the, the, the length of the line, and where they coincide in time, we sort of stack them on top of each other and then color them according to the genres um, that we, we determined that, that, that they had. And you sort of end up with this thing which is almost look, has the sense of like a geological kind of layering. Um, and again, a heavy use of labels, um, both for the, um, the genres like jazz and country and rock and roll, 1960s pop, um, rock, uh, Dunedin sound, um, through to hip hop, electronica. Um, but where it started, and I'm just going to step you through over a few minutes before wrapping with um, the process that we went through. So right through from that sort of visual thinking through to visual communication. So originally where I started was actually a totally different data source to what we ended up with. Um, I was looking at Discogs, um, which is a big kind of global database of music, um, and I wanted to create something which sort of showed not really a temporal view of, of New Zealand music, but instead a, um, a view in terms of the associations between artists and who played with who and what scenes were connected and that sort of thing. So. In order to do this, this is all still that private realm exploration. Um, I wrote a, um, this was actually in Python, I wrote a spider program that crawled across um, Discogs looking for every New Zealand artist I could find. Um, and so I, it crawled across, it collected all of those artists, just downloaded the web pages and looked at the, um, at the sort of semi-structured data behind it. And then I wrote a second program that took the harvested data and transformed it into a network graph that connected all of the um, artists that are in common. So this was like this is just a screenshot of one of those things. So every circle here is a different artist, um, and all of the lines are kind of like coincidences between it. So if someone played with someone, um, someone was in uh, Martin Phillips is in the Chills, and then there's all these other people's in the Chills, but they play in other Dunedin bands too. Um, so the people were the links, and the nodes were the bands, and it was just kind of <laughs> like it was it was like 
is something, but it was just a big old mess, and it was really hard to find a way to, to make it legible. Um, the other thing that happened along the way was it was actually really difficult to reliably identify New Zealand artists within the, within the corpus that we were working, within um, Discogs. So instead I turned to um, Audio Culture, which was a smaller um, data set um, as my source of artists, but it was also it was dedicated to New Zealand music, which was, was really kind of like cut out like a big problem that we had where, where sort of a lot of artists were doing international collaborations and it was sort of difficult. So again, sort of different structure. It was really great. They had these pages that I could kind of index pages sort of lurking in the background. So I could write a different harvester, work through all of these audio culture pages, pull those out, and then we sort of built this thing that was sort of uh, looking at the labels and the artists and how labels and artists were connected. And then another thing, which actually, I think the things in blue, um, audio culture has the notion of scenes, labels, and artists. And so we've got scenes in blue. So the top left is all, like all of these articles about the jazz scenes, which are kind of off by themselves. There's a big cluster, which is like hip hop Aotearoa artists. There's flying nun over to the right. There's kind of like 60s rock with like, you can see things like Ray Columbus, uh, Ray Columbia, Ray Columbus um, and Zodiac and a bunch of others down in the bottom left. Again, though, like trying to lay them out on the page and try and find a way to do it, it was just sort of overwhelming and, and, and just kind of like just a big blur of names. Um, so then, uh, then I went on like a whole tangent where I started looking at the structures of individual songs. So this was like um, some analysis I did. This in particular was Lord Royals and looking at the verse and word structures and I did some more stuff with Damn Native, um, uh, Behold My Cool Style. I think that might actually be on the left there. And Lord was on the right. And it was just, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> and then, then I worked with Gareth Shoot, who's actually at the back of the room. Um, and we instead, after all of this exploration, just went, th read basically the entire Audio Culture website. Um, and Gareth is a writer on Audio Culture and went through every single artist there and made up our own spreadsheet um, of um, sort of removing people like Dylan Tate, who are journalists rather than artists, and just looking at when, they, when the artists started performing, when they stopped performing, and coming up with a classification of genres. Um, and then wrote a D3 program in order to visualize that, do the initial layout, and then finally handed that over to Tim once it was kind of roughly laid out. So you can see there that's the left hand side. I did the whole thing. And Tim um, and I worked to, Tim especially colored it up um, and made it look really beautiful. And that's where it ended up. And that was, cons <laughs> that was probably about 150 hours of work, um, which is the, definitely the biggest visualization and like the longest in the, um, in the book. Um, but I'm really glad that we did that. But that was the process. Like, that was the whole thing from start to go. And then in contrast, when I worked at the New Zealand Herald, we had to put a, New a vaccine tracker at the top of the website, and I spent about two and a half hours on the first version, and this is the second version, which is about another 90 minutes, and it's probably the most, one of the most high-impact things I've ever worked on. So it doesn't need to be, like, 150 hours. It can be, if it's the right thing in the right frame, um, it can be something that's really influential. Like that thing sat on the top of the Herald's website for, I don't know, I can't remember COVID to be honest, but for a long time. Um, and it definitely generated a lot of um, uh, conversation and people did really, really engage with this thing. And we got, I got all sorts of, uh, <laughs> feedback from all sorts of people, but um, <laughs> on the whole, it was actually really appreciative. It was really, really good, and it was something people would watch this thing every day, and it was, there was a bit of maintenance to it, but all up probably about four or five hours of work, um, and that was over two different versions of it. Um, and that, I think I'm just going to call it there. I've got a few more little slides, but I'm just going to leave it because we're at time. <laughs> Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, I think we've got about a few minutes for a few questions. 
It's so self-explanatory that nobody seems to have any question. So you, on the original, you have this quote about how about the visual displays letting you find structures. Or is yes, Cassava, uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, to what extent is there a problem that it lets you find the structures whether they're there or not? Oh, <laughs> oh. I mean, it's, it's, yes, it is a problem. Um, I mean, I think that the same, the same, uh, cautionary note can be leveled at statistics in, in general. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's absolutely a thing. And I think that it requires experience and it requires discipline. Um, and I see, I do see a lot of irresponsible data visualization out there. Like sometimes it's irresponsible in my opinion um, because uh, there's, um, overfitting is the wrong word for this, but it's almost that you're, um, I mean, Monmanier, who I showed the, uh, the, the four um, sort of descriptive maps from with the, with the crossing of the river, he wrote his most famous book is not um, uh, Expository Cartography in the Humanities. His most favorite book is How to Lie with Maps. Um, and you can lie with maps either deliberately or accidentally. Um, through the use of, um, especially through the use of class breaks, um, through obfuscation, through various curatorial decisions that get made, through the use of colour. Um, there's, there's, there's so many different ways and I think it comes down to uh, like so much of the, um, kind of work like this, it comes down to acting in, a combination of acting in good faith um, it comes down to experience and sort of knowing where things are and just holding yourself back a bit just because it, it's a good, just because you know it's going to be a good story, it doesn't necessarily mean you should do it. Um, and the thing that I didn't show, haha, -ha, <laughs> um, is, is actually showing it to people and working with um, an audience and making sure that the interpretations that people make, and this is something I've actually had quite a lot, is people misinterpreting stuff that I made. And when that happens, that's not their fault. That's my fault. Um, it's that I haven't got there yet. Um, and so by testing your ideas. The dots Did I do for, it? For, um, that was me. That was you. Yes. yes, absolutely. That map I learned so much from. <laughs> that map, I still stand by that map. <laughs> <laughs> Except that I did not. Wrong, wrong it, audience, possibly. I was the wrong audience and the wrong map. And what I did not understand in that map, that was a long time ago, but and I learned such a an incredible lesson there, that as soon as you start representing individuals, even if you're randomly assigning their locations, they will misinterpret that map, and they will not just misinterpret it, they will leap to the conclusion that you've precisely mapped their location. Um, and it's a really difficult thing. And that map I should not have published in that forum. Yeah. So I had another question. Uh, if you go back to the music uh, one. Sure. I don't know what to call it. Is it a chart? No. <laughs> so it seems to, how does the width change? Is that something to do with the number of labels published, number of songs, and why does it kind it, of? It's the number of artists. So right. what's happening there is that, <laughs> well, what's behind it is that lots of people are writing about music from the uh, 1990s and 2000s, and that there's not a lot of writing about music in the, and there's fewer artists as well sure. in these earlier periods. But every single line, so if we take one of these lines, um, it's a bit hard, so this is, where are we? So um, the 2000 is here. I yeah, think. so Emma Paki well, is like her. She starts somewhere in the uh, 1990s and then kind of like continues on her career and then kind of like at some point here, um, her, um, she stops like releasing recorded music at least for the time. And so the cumulative effect is that you've got any one year is how many artists seem, according to, um, our research, at least, seemed to be performing at the same time over so that year. So something happened after 2010 where the numbers started. Is that something to do with the change in the yeah. modality of uh, music being shared? No, what, what that is, is that's, um, so in the text we say that audio culture is a, um, 
Audio culture is a work in progress, so this visualization is incomplete. Although gaps remain, acts from the 1970s through the 2000s are well documented. Emerging artists and art musicians from the first half of the 20th century are less well represented. And then later, um, that we talk about how um, artists later on are also. So you've got people like Lord in there. Lord's yeah, got an article, right, yeah. but many other contemporary artists aren't being written about yet in audio culture because they haven't made their mark, and it's still a little bit uncertain as to as to where they'll be. Is that accurate, Gareth? Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, any final question before? Isn't there a danger you stop when you get something pretty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Or, or is it more about the journey? I mean, increasingly, I am just... I'm not that good, I think, at making pretty maps. I, that's why I work with Tim. Tim's really, really good. He's a, such a talented graphic designer. Um, the maps that I make in day to day, uh, I try and just make them really useful. But they're not great looking maps. They're very simple prosaic maps, most of them. The unrequited yeah. artist and the statistician. <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah, I'm not sure I would characterize it like that, but maybe some days, yeah. <laughs> so on that note, guys, let's thank Chris once more. It's a fabulous talk. Uh, and here is what we were all waiting for.